Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nervisesha Shanyavadi Paschachate Shatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so we welcome everyone to their second session. Okay, can I ask everybody to please mute yourselves because there's a lot of background noise coming. I can hear some people talking to people in the background. Thank you. So can, we, can I begin? Um, yeah, I think you can begin, Marj. There's a few, still a few people missing, but I think we should start because um, otherwise we start to run a bit late. Right. Okay, so now this morning, this is our second session on the Nectar of Instruction at the level of Bhakti Shastri. I want to continue from where we left off. We had not completed the first section which we were discussing, right? I'm just going to uh, share the screen. Hmm? Hmm. <laughs> what happened? Yes, we can see that now. Okay. Uh, so we spoke. Maybe let's begin. We'll recite the verse. Vacho vigam manasa kroda vigam. Vacho vigam Jiva vigam mudarapasta vigam. Jiva Etan veganyo vishaheta dira. Etan veganyo vishaheta dira. Sarvam apimam pritivim shashishyat. Sarvam apimam pritivim shashishyat. Right, a sober person who can tolerate the urge to speak, the mind's demands, the reactions of anger, the urges of the tongue, the belly and the genitals is qualified to make disciples around the world. Okay, so in the purport, everyone with me? Everyone can follow? Yes. You can see the screen? Quoting a little bit from the purport, Prabhupada was speaking about Christians going to church to confess their sin. And we spoke for a little bit about prayaschit, atonement. Oh, right. Sorry, can I just interrupt you for one second? It seems you, there are a few messages on the screen that your audio is not so clear. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, I'll have to speak more into the microphone. Yes, please. Uh, Thank you. Uh, can I suggest something? If people have their mics on, it will feed back, we'll hear it, and it will sound terrible. If everybody in the whole room mutes, except for Maharaj, it'll be much clearer. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point, Jagainitai Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. So the purport begins with Srila Prabhupada talking about atonement. Because when the senses are uncontrolled, then there will be the tendency to commit sinful activities. And a pious person will think about how to atone for those sins. So in the purport, Srila Prabhupada discusses how there are 
various processes by which one could perform atonement. And he explains about coming to real knowledge and how there's a standard process, right? Mentioned, tapasya brahmacharyena samena cha damena cha, right? One should practice these kind of things, do austerity and practice celibacy and different ways of controlling the mind and senses by way of atonement. But the actual atonement is to come to the platform of real knowledge and the best process of atonement is to actually come to Krishna consciousness, if we can awaken our Krishna consciousness. Just to read here from the purport, one can be gradually elevated to the standard of real knowledge or Krishna consciousness by practicing austerity and celibacy, brahmacharya, by controlling the mind, by controlling the senses, by giving up one's possessions in charity, by being avowedly truthful and by keeping clean and by practicing yoga asanas. So all of these different things help one to come to the platform of real knowledge, some mean, by means of purification. But then Srila Prabhupada adds, however, however, if one is fortunate enough to get the association of a pure devotee, he can easily surpass all the practices for controlling the mind by the mystic yoga process, simply by following the regulative principles of Krishna consciousness, refraining from illicit sex, meat-eating, intoxication and gambling, and by engaging in the service of the Supreme Lord under the direction of the bona fide spiritual master. This easy process is being recommended by Srila Rupa Goswami. So Srila Prabhupada brings his discussion on atonement to the conclusion that the best way to practice atonement is simply to have association with a pure devotee. In other words, to come to Krishna consciousness and learn how to serve under a pure devotee, under the direction of a spiritual master. Simply by coming to Krishna consciousness, then we will naturally follow these regulative principles. We will naturally practice these different other things which people are doing. Krishna consciousness is the ultimate process of purification. All right, so then we have a quote here from Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur which is taken from his commentary on Upadesha Amrita. Devotees are intent on yukta vairagya, and thus they remain aloof from dry renunciation. Therefore, the regulation to abandon all contact with the sense objects does not pertain to them. So, would someone like to tell me how they understand this term, yukta vairagya. Do we have some hands up? Krishna Keshav Prabhu? Sorry, Krishna Vijay would like to respond to that, Maharaj. Okay. Uh, Mar yukta vairagya means, uh, uh, in, like Mayavad, they want to renounce their senses, but instead of that, engaging the service, uh, sensing the service of the Lord, that is a real uh, renunciation. So, yukta vairagya means what? Engaging the senses in the service of the Lord. All right. So, renounce yukta vairagya is giving up activities which are not in relation to Krishna, but uh, do accepting whatever is favorable for Krishna, right? Yukta vairagya. Yukta, I mean, in relation to Krishna. 
So our vairagya should be in relation to Krishna. Can you give us an example, Prabhu, of yukta vairagya? Mm, like, um, like instead of hearing, uh, like, um, like people take sannyas just for uh, like um, renounce, but actually sannyas is for preaching about Krishna, Krishna consciousness. Yes. Yes. The the Mayavadis, why do they take sannyas? Why does a Mayavadi take sannyas? Because uh, Maya, Mayavadi uh, thinking uh, they themselves want to con uh, they themselves like think that. Uh, um, they want to, actually they think that they want to do some certain thing, they want to renounce. It's not that Krishna wants, it's not the scripture wants. Why do they want to renounce? Because they think uh, this whole, uh, like, whatever is in this material world, everything is false. Right, that's the answer, right. They, they say this world is unreal, right? They say, Brahman Satyam Jagat Mitya. The, this, the world, only the Brahman is real and the, this world is all illusion, all false. So they, they take sannyas to give up the world. But a Vaishnava takes sannyas for what purpose? To preach Krishna consciousness. To, to use everything in the service of Krishna to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. Right? This, that is Yukta Vairagya. And how, what did Rupa Goswami, how, how did he describe this Yukta Vairagya? Do you know the verse? Anybody know the verse? Yukta Vairagya, Rupa Goswami is talking about Yukta Vairagya. Nirbanda Krishna Sambande Yukta Vairagya Uchati. Right. Actual renunciation is in relation to Krishna. To utilize everything in the service of Krishna. Just like we are utilizing this Zoom application in the service of Krishna. Now the person who designed this technology they were not thinking of service to Krishna, but the devotees, they think of service to Krishna and they think how to use it in the service of Krishna. And Prabhupada encouraged us like that, that we could use technology for the service of Krishna. And Prabhupada often gave the example about the microphone and his dictaphone, how he's using it all in the service of Krishna. But dry renunciation, someone can tell me more about dry renunciation? Give some examples. Hari Haresh Vari Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, so the dry renunciation means uh, like Mayavadi sannyasis, they renounce, uh, renounce from uh, things like money and all thinking that they will uh, it, it is a maya, but we should not uh, touch money. But what Prabhupada taught us is like uh, we should use whatever we have, including money and everything, in Krishna's service. Yes, very good. Nice example. Someone else like to contribute more about dry renunciation? Ananta Vilas Prabhu. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, so actually, uh, there was an example given of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasil Thakur. People used to tell him, like, uh, he's a sannyasi, but he's using uh, cars and other uh, uh, other things like uh, aeroplanes and all. They, they used to, uh, uh, like, criticize him, how come he's using all these things. But uh, he, he was... 
he he moreover gave the silasi of yukta vairagya using it in krishna's service so all the people were renunciating oh the sanyasi should not use these things in krishna's service but uh, the they were more of an uh, conception of like uh, falsely uh, in a conception that a sanyasi should be a false renunciate but uh, bhakti sanyas thakur gave us the right understanding of using everything in krishna's service okay thank you prabhu Yes. And you got Karuna Sindhu Prabhu would also like to say something, Maharaj. Okay. Prabhu Ji, Karuna Sindhu, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, dry renunciation means that uh, many many yogis are there that say they will not see anything, will not uh, hear anything, and they try to do some very hardship. Hard aspect, they try to do them, and that makes their heart very dry and very hard-hearted. Yes. So I think that... Very good. Very good points, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Yes, they want to stop everything, to stop the senses. But as it said here, they want to abandon all contact with the sense objects. They don't want to see anything. Sometimes they go to, go away from the world. I will not see any woman. Right? I will not touch money. Marriage said. They don't want to eat. Right? They, Oh, so very dry practice, makes the heart very hard. But Yukta Vairagya, which is the renunciation is taught by Rupa Goswami, makes the heart soft, that we develop our loving relationship with Krishna and we feel compassion and concern for all living entities. So, very different experience. All right. So let's see. This is a li little question for you. You might consider how you would respond to something like this. You're at a public function and been told the cheese is vegetarian. After the meal, you find out that the cheese actually contained animal rennet. How do you react? What's your attitude? What do you do? Someone like to respond to this? In the Lekha Kripa Mataji, your hand is raised. Would you like to contribute to this? You're on mute, Mataji. You need to unmute yourself. Uh, no problem. Yeah, I had a question about the previous this one about the stopping idea of the drive idea. No, we want to. We want. We finish that topic. We want to go on to this topic. Okay. We'll come back to your question later, Mataji, if that's okay. Yes. Oh, you had a question, was it? Yes, she's got a question. Oh, okay. What's the question? Okay, Mataji, go on. Yeah, the question was, Manas, that uh, now these gain people they uh, uh, cover their mouth and they won't wear the eye. Is it like anything with the vairagya? Is it a dry or any other, uh, yeah, the Jains uh, practicing that kind of renunciation, cover the mouth, not to kill anything. Yes, it's, that's also dry. That's also dry. Dry renunciation. Yes, and you, you can see the Jains also. They they will walk everywhere, and they sweep the road. Of course, they sweep the road as they walk and wear the ahimsa silk. It's very dry renunciation. Okay. Jains are, they don't believe in, in God actually. They don't have a theistic philosophy. It's very close to Buddhism. So the, the Buddhists also, they practice that kind of renunciation, dry. Our renunciation, renunciation is good, but our renunciation should be in relation to Krishna. Just like fasting, you know, we fasted yesterday, well, half a day on, in honor of Srila Prabhupada. We fast on ekadasis, we do these kind of things. That's our renunciation. It's in relation to Krishna. Go to holy places is also renunciation. Okay, 
so have some do we have some responses to this question if we do um, let's go to chagai nitai prabhu chagai maharaj uh, so um if it's, so so the question here is how do you react to what is your attitude what would you do i would um kindly respectfully explain why animal rennet should not be consumed i would not like freak out and make a scene because it wasn't intentional and knowing that we're engaged in preaching and and engaged in uh proper submission that, that these uh, mistakes can be forgiven okay very nice thank you anybody else has a different attitude towards this tendra the vrindavan prabhu yeah uh, so my thought was similar only that uh, in our minds we should beg for for lord krishna saying that this was not intentional uh, but because we are living in living in this uh, kali yuga age so all these things are uh, are uh, going to happen and uh, we have just uh, eaten this by mistake we were not aware of that this cheese contains uh, animal uh, rennet thing so just we should have to beg for forgiveness to krishna okay yes thank you we we'll just take one more if there is somya mata ji hi krishna maharaj uh i would take a promise or not before shakal but uh that i won't eat any prashadam uh, which is, i won't eat any food which is not offered to krishna yes that's nice that's one way to avoid these kind of things going to public functions can always be a problem because you don't know how the food has been prepared you don't know who are the people preparing the food you have to be very cautious so public functions you can go but sometimes it can be a problem if you take the food which is given there all right so oh we're not going to do this we, we this is when we have a classroom experience we can do this kind of thing but here are some more questions for us it's just nice to go through these points to make it clear what our standards should be first of all when is it all right to eat in the home of life members who invite us chaitanya chandra prabhu yes prabhu hari krishna maharaj Hare Krishna. What was the actual response of the previous question? As per you, because we took the response from the students, what was the actual response would be from our side? Well, it will vary according to the individual. The main thing is we should not get angry, right? But it, we made the mistake by eating at the public function. that in, in itself is dangerous i explained you go to a public function you should be very careful you can, usually it's better not to eat at public functions and then you simply say i sorry i don't eat out i only eat i have a special diet and i only eat my own food or you know explain to the people nicely it's and if you we, we eat we eat something and you find out later it's got rennet in it you know it's our own fault we have to admit the guilt on our part that i should we should be more cautious and certainly when you see cheese you can immediately be doubtful about it some doubts about it it's not you know if you get some paneer that's different but if you get some processed cheese then you don't know what's in it you should be very cautious thank you boss all right so num question number 1 when is it all right to eat in the homes of life members who invite us let's go to sachidananda prabhu 
Thank you, Prajee. Uh, Maharaj, uh, as well as my experience has been in uh, preaching or sometimes in collection. So, uh, to the life members who invite us, I, uh, inform, I uh, tell them about what we eat, uh, being a Christian devotee, that we do not eat onion garlic. And uh, we prefer to eat maybe some dry food, foods only at the house of life members who invite us. And uh, we all, I also prefer to first get it offered. Or I also myself offer it in front of them and inform them that everything should be offered to Lord Krishna. So uh, this is one way. And uh, uh, sometimes also in a few situations where the uh, members are not very favorable or they uh, seem to be get irritating of us of these things. So I, uh, in order to preach, I just try to avoid the offering and I just tell them that I'm following certain diet and I may take a little milk product or a little fruit, that's it. So this is how I do. Yes, very good. Thank you. Yes, Srila Prabhupada certainly was concerned about this and told devotees to be cautious about accepting invitations from people I know one time in England, a Srila Prabhupada was invited by one man to come to his home. So Srila Prabhupada immediately asked him, do you cook meat at home? And the man said, well, yes. So then Prabhupada immediately replied, then I will not come. <laughs> and so that, that reaction from Prabhupada went into the heart of the man and he changed. And the, he made the whole family, the whole home become vegetarian after that. Now sometimes that we see in Prabhupada Lila Amrita, there's some interesting examples recounted. Uh, one time, at least, at least one time, I, I can't remember exactly where, which city it was in, but it was after a big program and they were all invited to the member who had organized the program all the devotees were invited and they all sat down and they were eating the food and the devotee turned to Prabhupada turned to Prabhupada and said Prabhupada there's onions in this and Prabhupada said there's no onions in it and the devotee said no Prabhupada there is onions in it really there's onions in it and Prabhupada just blasted him there are no onions in it eat <laughs> So Prabhupada didn't want to offend the life member. So in that particular case, the devotees ate food, although they had some onions in it, it was the order of the spiritual master. Prabhupada himself, however, he didn't eat, <laughs> but he had the devotees eat. So on the order of the spiritual master, if the spiritual master is directly there and he orders you, to eat, then you should do it. You have to do it. Prabhupada didn't want to offend a very important, a very helpful life member. So that was a very special situation. But generally, we do want to be cautious about going to homes of life members. Because we know today, you know, a lot of people, they do eat meat, they do have non-vegetarian foodstuffs, many of them life members, they mean, they're, they're not yet devotees, they're just, you know, businessmen or wealthy people who are helping our movement, favorable to our movement. So we have to be careful in dealing with them and as Prabhu explained very nicely in his answer, you know, we tell them, you know, we have a special diet and they should understand that from the beginning. We have to explain that we have our rules and we have, we're Vaishnava, Vaishnava. I remember Prabhupada telling us uh, one time Mayapur, I think it was 76, he, t he sat on the Vyasa San. All the devotees had come from the West and they were all there and we were all sitting there in the temple room in Mayapur and Prabhupada gave the first address. One of the first things he said to all the devotees was, Please do not eat in the restaurants. They said, you are all dressed as Vaishnavas, devotees. You're wearing kunti neck beads, 
Tosimala around your neck, you're putting on tilak, many of you have shaved heads. Please do not go in the restaurants and sit and eat. This is not the business of Vaishnavas. <laughs> and it was amazing because so many devotees had come to India with the intention of doing that. They were thinking, I'm going to go in the restaurants and check out everything, I want to see what they cook and what, what they... And Prabhupada also mentions about not going to sweet shops also. And so, you know, Prabhupada has very clear standards what he expected for the devotees. So we apply these standards also in the homes of life members. They, they invite us, very nice, but they have to understand we have our rules. So as Prabhu said, dry fruit, uncut fruit, that's better, that's the best, that's what we should be taking. If they're not yet devotees, we don't know. Otherwise we bring the food ourselves from the temple, that can also be done. Is it clear? First question? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Okay, we'll go ahead. Second one. How important is it not to eat food cooked by karmis? Someone can respond? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, it is very, very important because uh, if we take food from karmi, it explains that uh, it can contaminate our health, especially our uh, sadhana and also some karmic reaction, uh, we can suffer about that. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, right. Even what to speak of food, you take money from karmis, you can also get it's also going to pollute our minds. You have to be very careful. So certainly food cooked by karmi, particularly grains, Srila Prabhupada said, people like to give grains to the devotees because they're giving their karma. They're getting rid of their karma by giving us food grains, by giving us food. So we should be very careful taking food cooked by karmis. I think that's quite clear to everyone. Any questions on that? Number two? Yes. Yes? Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, as you mentioned, you should not take money and uh, food grains also. Not cooked food. But as you take some donations from karmis or some, someone gives some rice and some other stuff. So how to... We take some uncooked rice, you mean? Yeah, ma yes, ma yeah, we take the uncooked rice and we offer it to Krishna. Right? We take yes. it we take it and offer it to Krishna. So we accept it, we accept the uncooked rice, we take it, we cook it and we offer it to Krishna. So in that way then it's all right. But Prabhupada also said he, he liked us to, cook, to, to grow our own grains. He didn't like us just to depend on everybody else growing the foodstuffs and we just cook it. He said, we should produce our own food, grow our own rice, produce our own wheat. That's the best. That's, it. That, that's ultimately, but, but until we get to that level, we have to make use of what's available. So we take rice, we accept the rice, we we bring it, we wash it, we cook it, and we offer it to Krishna, and then we can take prasada. All right? Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj, Bengal Prima. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, sometimes we go to our relatives' places and our houses, and as such, they are not on devotees, even though they worship various demigods, and on festival days and all, they offer the bhoga to lords. How do we manage in such situations, whether to accept the food cooked by them or they will be uh, considered as karmis only if they are not following this, uh, all these regular principles and uh, Krishna Bhakti? Yes, actually it's a fact. 
<laughs> they're, they're, they may be pious, but they're on the material platform. So generally we won't take foodstuffs cooked by them. You, you're going to visit somebody's home, you're going to visit your relatives and like that. You know, have your wife go and cook. Let her cook. That's the best. Okay, but you go, you take, you go to their home. They're not devotees, so certainly it's it's not, you know, it's not the, it's not really prasadam. I don't, are they vegetarian? You can consider. Maybe the relatives. You may say they're vegetarian. They worship demigods, but they're vegetarian, so they're a little pious. So can we take the food they cook if we offer it to Krishna? Well, that's up to you. You have to consider yourself. What is your standard of devotion? They're cooking. They're not cooking for Krishna. They're cooking for you. So they have a different consciousness. That's a problem. Does it, uh, Maras, does it affect my sadhana, my consciousness? Well, well, it is going to affect the mind to some degree. Definitely, it's, there's going to, it's not like taking food cooked by a devotee. Everything depends on the consciousness of the person. Now the cook, we know the cook and the pujari the person offering, they should be brahmanas. In other words, they should be pure souls. Right? The person who cooks and the person who offers are very important in every temple because the quality of the prasadam will depend on the consciousness. So that's why the, the cook is a, you know, he should be a Brahmin, twice initiated. He should be pure, strictly following. And then they can cook for the deities. So you may say, well, I'm going to home, it's my home, you know. Oh, all right, you have, so you take some, some risk there. You, certainly it's not going to be first class prasadam. There's, you know, there's first, second, third class, <laughs> you know. Maras, I was uh, told by some of our senior uh, preachers and all, uh, even if we go to such houses, if they offer food, you offer it to Lord Krishna first and accept it as prasad. Because they don't use uh, onion, garlic and all. Only thing, they are not in this process and uh, we cannot consider the cook as a Vaishnava or Brahmi, even though by cash they are Brahmis. Yes. Yes, right. So, I said it's up to the individual, it's up to you to decide, you know, time, place and circumstances. You have to consider. So sometimes you have to make these adjustments. You know, it's not something you want to do regularly, but you know, maybe for a day or two you ha you're in that situation, you're at home there, you're spending time with relatives or people, you know. So sometimes you may have to come down a little bit in your standards. But as you say, you know, they are caste Brahmins and they are vegetarian, they don't use onion and garlic. And so there's some level of purity there. But it's not devotion. Right? They don't have devotion. They're not devotees. They're not, they don't understand Krishna. They don't chant the holy name of Krishna. So, it's up to the individual. You have to decide for yourself. We get these things everywhere in the world. You know, it comes up. That we have to sometimes make adjustments. So, Srila Prabhupada, when he was traveling, sometimes he's traveling on the train, he would purchase things cooked in the, on the, in the railway platform. Sometimes, sometimes he'd send a devotee, go and purchase something from, from the railway platform. Time, place and circumstances. Important thing, you know, generally, you know, if you're traveling, like Prabhupada was traveling, he was traveling for preaching. 
So the preaching is the important thing. You know, some little bit lower standard about the prasadam, that may be there, but the important thing is the preaching, and that makes up for it. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you so much. So number three, when can we eat food cooked by machines? You know, there's a lot of food cooked by machines these days. You get all kinds of machines preparing it, especially noodles and uh, even you've got chapati, ma <laughs> chapati machines and pizza machine, bread machine. Anybody? Sorry. Yes? Like to respond, Prabhu? No, no, go on, carry on, Maharaj. Well, I'm as, is someone, someone can respond to number three? Acharya Nanda Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Well, of, uh, what I think is, machines, they don't have consciousness, don't have the questions. So I think the answer is no. We cannot, we cannot eat food cooked by machines. But I have heard that if the, the this machine is available in the devotees also. The devotee use this machines to cook the food, or in the temple. Uh, I heard that we can we can take that food. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good. If devotees are using it, devotees are using machines. We said use everything for Krishna, right? Yukta vairagya. So we use machines sometimes to cook. We're cooking big quantities and we have to be a bit more mechanized sometimes. And so, if it's cooked by devotee, yeah. And number four, should we eat the meals provided on airplanes? Okay, Mayuri Krishna Mataji. Hi, well. Uh, I think that we actually eat the meals provided on the airplane because it's um, heated up in the same like containers and it's also heated with the other um, food which is also like having meat, onion, garlic and mushroom and things like that. So we shouldn't eat? Um, no. Yeah, I would agree with you, yeah. And Prabhupada's instructions, it's also like that. He said he didn't like, he didn't want devotees to take the meals from the airplane. No, just people preparing the food are not devotees. So, you know, it's, if they give you a piece of fruit, again, if it's uncut fruit, they may bring you an apple or a banana, all right. You can wash it, you can offer it, you can take that. But cooked meals, no. Not for devotees. When Prabhupada would travel, he would always bring his own meal with him. And they would always have a tiffin and Prabhupada would sit and he would have his meal in the flight. Of course, nowadays with all the restrictions, the security, it's very difficult. But in Prabhupada's time, it was quite different. So Prabhupada would bring his meal with him and he would sit in the plane and he would eat. Okay, any questions about this? Is it all clear? Okay. Um, can we go to Chakai Nitai Prabhu? You have your hand raised. Sorry, that was, an, that was not intentional. Okay, all right. Then um, Indu Lekha Kripa Mataji. Uh, I have been told that the machine is cooked because I have seen some students that is saying now the market is available that uh, they have been cooked on the with the manufacturer on the they are using eggs and some other nuts or anything like that. So we are not using that one, but still Indian made because I am not very really clear about the answer for that. They are avoiding this. They have some messages written on that one that they are using the machines. They have reviews. But what about the Indian food? 
Uh, I'm, I'm not able to quite understand your voice. The voice is not clear. There's a lot of echo there. Could you get it all, Krishna Keshava? I didn't know. Mataji, maybe you can put that question in the chat box. Um, oh, and oh. Then I, yeah, just, just type it out and I'll, I'll read it out in a, in a moment. In the meantime, let's go to um, Srimati Karuna Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Maharaj, what is the difference between cut and uncut fruit? You specifically said twice or thrice that we should not have fruit which is cut by others. Why is it so much? Fruit which is cut by others? Is yes, it? Maharaj. Yes, well fruit because they may use the knife, the same knife is may be used to cut meat. You see the knife itself is contaminated. They use their knife, you know, they're using their knife to cut the meat or they use the knife to eat their non-vegetarian food. You know, meat eaters use two hands to eat. They hold a knife and fork, usually. <laughs> so they, they give you a knife, even a, a kitchen knife. Kitchen knife may, be, may have been used to cut meat or you know, chopping the onions and garlics and so on. And it's not going to be uh, pure. That's the problem. That's, Thank you. that's why we want uncut fruit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can we go ahead? Yes, Mark. Okay. Okay. Just to speak about this, maybe we could just hear from the devotees uh, some different methods, Krishna conscious methods to control the urge to speak, first of all. Could we get some responses from the, the students about how we, what are appropriate means to control this urge to speak in Krishna consciousness? Um, Gadadhar Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, regarding the control and urge of, to speak, uh, we have to engage our uh, tongue in speaking Krishna consciousness topic and also uh, uh, not to not uh, reading too much uh, uh, other literatures or uh, like a mundane a newspaper or something like that and also Prabhupada mentioned in the uh, purport in the text once just like a uh, croaking throat uh, invite the snake so also like that we have to control our uh, speak or tongue especially so that we uh, uh, not to speak uh, other than Krishna Kata. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you Prabhu. I want to tell all of you, by the way, that uh, you have essay questions to write on this Nectar of Instruction. And one of the essays which you have to write is the first question, which is in relation to text number one, controlling these different urges. So this will be helpful for you. You want to listen carefully to the responses which the devotees are giving and it will give you some clear ideas about how to present the essay. So the urge to speak, we said that, you know, speak about Krishna and chant the holy name of Krishna. Somebody, some people like to speak, that's good. Go and tell people about Krishna. We're very happy. Go out, you can take books and go, try to distribute books and speak. Some of our book distributors are very good speakers. They're very good in speaking. They can really impress people. And when people are, have a good impression, then it's easier for them to take a book and give a donation. So use your urge to speak in Krishna's service. What about urges of the body? Let's go to um, Jagai Nitai Prabhu. Okay, uh, 
Oh, we're on the body now? Okay. Um, I was going to say for the urge to speak also to not be critical and criticize others and devotees is an important uh, aspect of the urge to speak. Um, but the urge of the body, <coughs> uh, waking up early, not sleeping, I would say is a, a very important part of one's devotional service to get up early so you can chant your japa nicely in the morning, do seva, not be so worried about um, uh, the urge to sleep. But how, how to overcome this urge to sleep? Because that's the problem. That you see, we want, you say get up early, but how to do that? How to get up early? <laughs> you, know? you know, I'd like to get, you know, many, maybe some devotee feels, I'd like to get up early, but I just can't do it. I, I fall asleep and I don't get up and my alarm call goes off and I never hear it. And, you know, so you can, can you tell us about how to overcome this? Yeah, there's a trick and that's to go to bed early. That, that's the that's the trick. If we go to bed early, then we can wake up early. But if we stay up talking, watching movies, fooling around till 12 midnight, we're definitely not going to wake up at 4 a.m. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, get people early to bed, early to rise. Some people say, I go to bed early, I can't sleep because... <laughs> So used to sleeping late, so I go to sleep. If I go to sleep early, I'm not able to sleep. My body's not regulated to that. Yeah, it takes time. It takes some time, but when, eventually, you'll get into the habit, and then no matter what time you go to bed, you still wake up early. Okay. One thing also: av avoid taking rest during the daytime. Don't take any rest in the daytime. Don't, you don't want to do that because that will interact. If you take rest in the daytime, then more difficult to sleep at night. So try to avoid these things. How to, how, how to avoid taking rest in the daytime? Keep yourself busy. Get a lot of things to do. Go out. Don't sit around. You sit around and get, you get lazy. So try to keep ourselves always busy in the service of Krishna. So many things to be done. You, you don't have anything to do. Make giviks for the temple. They always need giviks. Make some giviks or go and polish the Arctic paraphernalia. Or go and, uh, <laughs> go and make the flower garlands for the deities. There are many things. Many services need to be done. We have to keep ourselves busy in Krishna's service, and that way we won't have the urges of the, the senses for gratification. Okay, minds demands. Let's go to Dhammadarjina Bhavana Prabhu. Please speak up a bit, Prabhu. I cannot hear you. I was about to say about the uh, urges of body. Okay, go ahead. Uh, here uh, in the lecture, Prabhupada was saying that uh, we should eat half of a uh, format. The balance 25% should be filled with water and balance 25% of our stomach should be empty. This will make our conscious move and we can wake up early in the morning, as mentioned by Srila Prabhupada in the lecture. Okay. So this will help our All right. So you're saying be careful. We should drink. When, when do you drink the water? After the meal? Before the meal, half an hour before the meal. Half an hour. Half an hour before the meal. Okay, that's good advice, right. Water before the meal is like nectar. Water during the meal is like medicine. Water after the meal is like poison. 
Don't take water after the meal. That's putting out the fire of digestion. But it's important to have a good quantity of water in the body. That's important. Also, Prabhupada taught us not to eat grains in the night. After, after, I, when I joined the movement, I was told, no grains after four o'clock. And so I was staying in different temples, I remember in London, then in New York, and whenever there was Mahaprasadam, the evening Mahaprasadam was not distributed until the next morning. They kept all the Maha until the next morning because they didn't want the devotees eating grains at night. Even the non-grains, we just keep it till the next morning. You don't want to be eating heavy things at night. That's helps us to overcome the urges. It's a training. As Prabhu, Prabhu said, this is, we required some training here. We have to train the body to overcome these urges. All right, we'll go ahead. Mine's demands. Someone like to volunteer? Purvandila Cheshwari Mataji. Uh, I like to say that if we engage our mind in uh, service of Krishna, or if we do hearing or chanting, also like, uh, like if we keep our mind uh, like empty, then a lot of other thoughts will come in our mind. So if we engage our mind in uh, Krishna service and engage in other service, then we don't have time for other thing which is not Krishna conscious. Okay, thank you. Anybody else like to add? Um, let's go to Shruti Mishra. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Can I answer? Yes, please. Uh, like uh, for a mind, it's like monkey. It is uh, explained in our scriptures. Mind is like monkey. It gets helping one or the other thing. So especially in today's time, social media is much a big distraction for mind. So like on Facebook and Instagram, we can have all the pages related to Krishna conscious stuff so that our mind don't get diverted to useless material mundane stuff. Okay. So fill our mind with Krishna consciousness, Krishna conscious news, Krishna conscious affairs, Krishna conscious activities. Okay. If, you have prob if we have problem in when chanting, then loud chanting is recommended. We see people like Koloveka Sridhar and Haridas Thakur, they also chanted the holy names loudly. It was not always appreciated, the loud chanting, but it's authorized. Certainly it's good to chant clearly so that you can hear the holy name. It can help us to control the mind. Going on, actions of anger. So we have um, Ananda Leela Mataji's hand is raised. Yes, Mataji. Uh, Hare Krishna. I was uh, going to say something on the mind's demands. Um, actually, each one of us are different and our likings and the way we want to serve is also like different in each aspect. So controlling the mind, like if somebody is into like speaking or somebody is into drawing or you know any kind of thing, so we can engage ourselves in that kind of activity. So in a sense, our mind is fully engaged in what we wanted to do. At the same time, we are doing it for in the service of Krishna, like painting or sewing or uh, anything, cooking, things like that. So if somebody is into that kind of field, then that person could do that more for Krishna and that way the mind is occupied and the person is not thinking here and there kind of thing. All right. Yes. Very nice. Good. Would you like to suggest, give us some hints about actions of anger? <laughs> well, um, like anger is something, um, Sometimes if we do control, then it just uh, blasts at some other point. So, uh, 
I, I personally feel that um, controlling the anger would be um, when when we do get anger anger or in any situation um, the best solution is to actually chant Hare Krishna Mahamudra. It may sound little um, hard or fanatic at times, but eventually the process works. It does work. Okay, so very good. Yeah, I agree with you. Chanting the Hare Krishna mantra is a very good way to help us to re release our anger. Take shelter of the holy name of Krishna. Okay, good. Anybody else like to offer something on the actions of anger? Let's go to somebody who hasn't spoken before. Raja Vidya Prabhu and the leading Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my uh, this, uh, a few years back, uh, there was a, uh, you know, a, who was teaching us on how to control the actions of anger. The very first thing what he had told, uh, uh, when you are angry, probably you do not be coming in the mind of uh, chanting the holy name. Best thing is to walk out, walk away, first deep breath, walk away, and pull down yourself, chant your chant, uh, and and then the actions can be controlled that way. Okay. Yes, nice. That's a good way. Yeah. You, you, if, you, if you're at home and you're, you somehow, something makes you angry, go out. Go out for a walk. <laughs> you calm down. Right? <laughs> yes. That's one, thing to, one way to do it. Yeah. Go out and, of course, take your japa bag with you and chant the holy name. Take shelter of the holy name. Okay. So we'll go ahead here. Just to show the objectives, what we've covered in the first lesson, we give the overview of Upadesha Amrita, right? As we go through it, we'll continue to update you on the progress of Upadesha Amrita. The purpose of Upadesha Amrita, remember, become pure Vaishnavas, become Goswamis, make our life successful. Personal application. Study of Upadesha Amrita could help to improve our attitude in Krishna consciousness. Definitely. The attitude, remember, very important. Attitude is to surrender, to have faith in the teachings and follow carefully. And then appropriate means of controlling the urges. We've been speaking about that for some time. Prabhupada's mood and mission, we discussed about Rupa Goswami in relation to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We explained about how Krishna consciousness is conducted under Srila Rupa Goswami. Concluding quote, In all spiritual affairs, one's first duty is to control his mind and his senses. Unless one controls his mind and senses, one cannot make any advancement in spiritual life. Everyone in this material life is engrossed in the modes of passion and ignorance. One must promote himself to the platform of goodness, sadvagon, by following the instructions of Rupa Goswami. And then everything concerning how to make future progress will be revealed. So taken from the preface, very important instruction. We'll see this kind of instruction come again and again. When you study Bhagavad Gita also it's there, the importance of cultivating the mode of goodness. Okay? And this is Srila Rupa Goswami Samadhi. Okay? So we're going to finish that text. So Maharaj, will you take a couple of questions? Yes. Which have come up on my screen. Um, first is from Induleka Kripamataji, who's asking, food made by machines, like imported noodles, pasta, etc., sometimes can t t contain traces of eggs. But what about these things made in India, which are marked as vegetarian? Can we use them? Well... Again, it's going to depend on the individual. 
time, the place and the circumstances. How important is it that you need to use it? How urgent is it? You know, you have to consider for yourself. We have to make these decisions on our own and you know, we can't make it a hard and fast rule. No, you cannot do this. No, you cannot do that. Everything has to, you know, you have to be intelligent and consider is this uh, the right thing to do? Is, this, is there any other alternative? Hmm. Is it very important that I use these ingredients? All right. I don't know if it's mar if it's marked vegetarian, should be all right. What is it? What kind of thing is it? Haribo? It's Haribo. It's things like no noodles or pasta um, that you buy in local shops in India. They have a little green dot. So that indicates that the product is vegetarian and there's not supposed to be any traces of any egg or meat products or fish products in, you know, in, in the actual product. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so generally, I would think it's okay to use. Yeah, we can buy we can buy these products quite a lot here. For example, in Mayapur, in the local shops, um, and they are used, you know, from time to time by devotees here. Um, sometimes devotees have children here, you know, and they need the, the devotees are working during the day and they need to get back at lunchtime and cook something quickly. So they may use the pasta that's available here. Um, we don't make pasta locally here, so, you know, stuff like this sometimes has to be used. But I think you're right. Um, I think we have to um, use our best judgment. It's a judgment call, isn't it? And yeah. According to the circumstance. Yeah, I mean, definitely Italians, they would need their pasta. You know? Yeah, <laughs> and there's a lot here, for example, in the Dam. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Italian people here, so... And similar, Chinese people, they like noodles, you know, they're fond yes. of noodles. Yes. Okay. Then so, I've got one more question, if that's all right. Yes. Um, and that is, um, Satchidananda Vishwambara Prabhu would like to know whether the consciousness of the one cutting fruit, for example, as you mentioned, on an aeroplane or somewhere, gets transferred to the fruit as well. The one cutting the fruit. <laughs> yes. Well... The important thing is what they use to cut the fruit. I don't know so much about the consciousness of the person, uh, but if they use, the, the utensil is important. It shouldn't be, you know, you know a, con, a, a knife which has been used for other things. In an aeroplane, to have someone cut fruit for you is not recommended. You def <laughs> Hare Krishna, can, uh, can I just uh, let clarify the question uh, if it is fine? Okay. Uh, I have I've just I understood uh, regarding the utensil, and I have also heard that uh, as uh, as we do not prefer to eat cooked food, eat by uh, uh, cooked by the karmis because the consciousness get transferred. So I, I heard somewhere. I've not read it, just heard it, that the, even uh, while the persons are cutting the fruit, it gets transferred. I just want, I wanted to clarify it, or to check it out. I well, understood regarding the utensils. Definitely it's possible, it would be possible. You, would, you want to be careful what kind of person who's cutting the fruit. You don't know, have they been to the toilet, have they, are they clean, you know, are they... You know, <laughs> especially these days with COVID-19, you know, you don't want to be taking food which is cut by just anyone. We do see cutting vegetables is a different thing. Like you go to Srinathji temple and uh, they, they let people visiting the temple cut the vegetables. But after they're cut, then they're all washed and then the vegetables are cooked. So it's a different thing. But with fruit, somebody's cutting fruit and then they give you it on a plate and the, eat, you know, you're supposed to eat. But you don't know, you know, if, was that person clean? Did he just come out of the toilet, you know, did he wash his hands carefully, you know? 
you want definitely want to be careful about these things. So it's good you're thinking like that. Uh, if, if we like keep about the uh, hygiene, if they are hygiene and if it's like utensils are also cleaned, just uh, wanted to clarify regarding the consciousness. Just uh, to that to clarify it. The consciousness. Well, their consciousness. You know that they're not Krishna conscious. They're not devotees. But generally, they have the mood. They want to offer some service to you. So it's up to you. Are you willing to give them mercy? Are you willing to take? to give mercy to them by accepting their service. You accept service from them, that is your mercy, your kindness. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, Maharaj, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Can everyone see the screen? Are the, is there a picture of the Goswamis there on your screen? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so going on to lesson two, we're going to speak on the unfavorable and the favorable activities, right? Now text one describes these different urges. Text two is going to describe the unfavorable. What happens when these urges are not controlled? And oh. Okay, we, we're not going to, we don't need revision. First verse. Oh, here, we can read this quote, nice quote here, from Radha Raman Goswami. He says, in the beginning stage of the practice of bhakti, the material proclivity is prominent in the hearts of the sadhakas. Therefore, they are unable to subdue the six overwhelming passions described in the first verse. Consequently, in this condition, many tendencies that are very harmful to bhakti develop in the hearts of the sadhakas. In this verse, those injurious tendencies are being described for the benefit of the sadhaka. Sadhaka means practitioner, right? Somebody who is engaged in the practice of bhakti yoga. So he's just describing, just as I mentioned, that when the urges are not controlled, then we develop these different tendencies, which we're going to hear six unfavorable attitudes or activities which develop due to the urges which are there. Okay, so here's the verse. Let's look at it. Atyahara prayashascha Atyahara prayashascha Prajopo niyamagraha Prajopo niyamagraha Jana Sangas Chaloyam Cha Shadbir Bhakti Vinashati So first point, first first first, first activity, Atyahara. Atyahara comes due to the Urges of the body could be due to the tongue, it could be due to the mind, right? But Ajahara, Prabhupada describes here, overeating or over collecting, too much collecting. You know, we have that, we all have this, this tendency in this modern consumer society, we collect things, you know, we you stay in a place, you st just stay here, stay in a room, you stay in a, a house for a few months, a few years, a few decades, you collect a lot of stuff, a lot of things you can collect. One devotee I know, he'd gone to the Middle East and he told me when he came to the Middle East, he came with a small bag 
And when he went back from the Middle East, after staying there about 20 years, he went back with two containers. <laughs> yeah. Of course, he had a family, he developed a family, children, so he had a lot, a lot more. So this is the nature of our human race. We have that tendency to collect, over collect. Sometimes overeating, sometimes over collecting. Overeating. Did you overeat yesterday? Did you have a feast yesterday? Did you overeat? No response. No, Maharaj. No, 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 Maharaj. Mm. Oh, no. I did, I did, Maharaj. It was a very wonderful piece and I did. <laughs> yeah. I went to Vrindavan and it was feast of Prabhupada. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure if you went to a temple, if you take the temple prasadam, probably you would overeat. There would be a big feast yesterday. And they prepare a lot. Wonderful <laughs> yes. preparations. So we have these problems, overeating and over collecting, and we have to be, be careful. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada begins a purport in text number two, speaking about simple living and high thinking. Simple living, minimizing the demands of our body and our senses, just trying to keep things basic. Oh, of course, it will be different for different people. Somebody is, you know, someone may be a businessman and, you know, businessmen, they have to have a, a, a good, a good size wardrobe. They need to have different clothes and suits, different things to meet their clients and meet their customers, deal with people. They cannot just be wearing the same clothes every day. And similarly, ladies. Ladies will also need to have a nice wardrobe, their clothes. Srila Prabhupada said one time, average woman will not be satisfied unless she has at least 30 saris. Is that enough nowadays, ladies? 30 saris, is that enough? No response. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Oh, I'm muted. Moment you're muted. Yeah, I see, I just see. You need to unmute. Uh -huh. What happened to my cursor? Maharaj, you're muted, we can't hear you. Okay. That, that's better, thank you. <laughs> I couldn't get my cursor. <laughs> you, you were saying that um, about wardrobes <laughs> and many saris, so we lost you at that point. Okay, so average lady needs about 30 saris, Srila Prabhupada said, and I was asking, is that enough? Is that sufficient for ladies nowadays? Because the other, the other week when I gave the class, someone said, oh no, 30 is not enough, they need 50 now. So what's it to be? Any response? Any Mataji's would like to come back on that one. How many saris do you need? Anantavi, uh, sorry, yes, Anantavilas. Yes, Prabhu, it's uh, Radhika Kishori. Uh, Radhika Kishori, Mataji, sorry, yes, go on. It's Hare Krishna Maharaj. I think 30 saris are good enough. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, what you, you, we should notice also the connection between Atyahara and Prayashash. Atyahara means, you know, over collecting. We want, you know, nowadays the consumer society, brand names, we want all these different things. Everyone wants a mobile phone, everyone wants Nike shoes. Everybody wants motor car, you know, so many things they need, we want. And to get these things, prayashash is there. Prayashash meaning over-endeavouring. What, what way they'll over-endeavour? 
someone like to tell me how could they over endeavor to get to fulfill their different desires what will they do like how Prabhupada says that we should uh, work that one that is required, not working too much. And people they work like 24 7 so that they can earn more money and they can uh, do enjoy, enjoy it, like they can do self gratification. So, yeah. yeah, working too much or endeavoring too much, which is not required, and which is like, like for example, uh, if working 9 to 5 is enough, but then People will work late night so that they can earn more money, like that. Yes, right. Very good. Yes, I agree. Some people have three jobs. They have a job in the day, a job at night, and another job on the weekend. You know? <laughs> and they have no time. They have no time to chant. I have no time to read the book. I'm so busy working. Why are they working? Because they want all, they want more. Their needs are more. I need this. I have to get that. It's all, you could say, ajahara. And so that ajahara, because the demands are there, then it becomes prayashas, and we over-endeavor, make great sacrifices, even people risk their lives sometimes, working in unhealthy situations, working in very dangerous situations. Why? Just to fill the belly, just to satisfy their their needs all right and then when the tongue is not controlled the tongue is active first of all in eating and then talking right after we eat good then people like to talk sit and talk so prajalpa so what's wrong with prajalpa is it harmful someone can say Hare Krishna Maharaj Dhanda Pranam. Yes, Prabhuji, uh, whatever is not connected to Krishna, if we speak any mundane things, that is, uh, comes under Prajalpa only. Because we were taught to chant the holy names, to speak the form, qualities of Lord Krishna, and uh, disassociate with non devotees, and we should not speak unnecessary topics like any politics or any ongoing situations, all these things, they can be avoided. So are, some... are we doing anything wrong if we talk mundane things? I mean, is it going to harm anybody? Uh, yes, it will harm me only because that is not at all related to me. It is, I am not much interested in that. If I speak what I get. I don't get any uh, benefit out of that kind of uh, unnecessary talks with anybody. If I can do some productive talk with anybody, like sharing some things about Lord Krishna, devotion or Prabhupada or any ISKCON devotees, that will help the other person also and it helps my consciousness also. Okay. Anybody else like to contribute to this Prajapa, the problems with Prajapa? Hindu Lekha Kripa Mataji. Mataji, you're muted, we can't hear you. Sorry, the, I have raised an hand for the previous Okay, thank you. So let, in that case, let's move to Chaitanya Chandra Prasad. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Prajalpa, when we speak, uh, no, we can offend someone by speaking something about someone. So this is from Imaham. Yes, I think that's the important point. That's the danger with Prajalpa. That we generally, when we talk, the talks come that we talk about people, we talk about others, and we may also generally we'll find fault, we'll criticize them, we'll say something like that. So this is the problem, this is the danger with Prajalpa. 
that we can, it can lead to offensive offenses and we can offend the Vaishnavas and that's very dangerous. So this is one reason, one very important reason about why we have to be careful about Prajapa. It was also said, nonsense talk, from nonsense talk will come nonsense thought, from nonsense thought will come nonsense action, and from nonsense action will come old age, disease and death. In other words, we'll stay in the material world. So, certainly, Prajapa should be avoided, it's unfavorable. And then, next point, next item, Niyam Agraha. An important term, which you have to know well, you have to understand properly, right? So, niyam means rules and regulations, N or niyam is the rules at least, eh? what we have to do, the things we're supposed to do, niyam, the chanting, the worship, the hearing, this is all niyam. And then agraha. And agraha, the, the, the term has two meanings. One meaning, too much attachment to rules and regulations, and the other side, neglecting the rules and regulations. So neglecting the rules and regulations is quite clear, that if we don't follow rules and regulations, that's going to be bad, that's not good. The rules are there to guide us how to develop our devotion and if we don't act, if we don't follow them, then certainly it will not help our Krishna consciousness. But how is it that if we're too much attached to the rules and regulations, it's going to be a problem? Would someone like to comment on this? Karuna Sindhu Hare Krishna Maharaj. Niyam Agraha. If we are too much uh, attached to the rules and regulation, one day uh, maybe we want to follow everything very nicely so that whatever material desires we have, that may be fulfilled. Yes. So that is not, it's not very favorable for what the I feel. Right. It's a tendency we may have. We may follow very nicely so that we can get some uh, material things. Yes, right. That's the point. Like that we're thinking materially. We're not thinking spiritually. They're following the rules and regulations just for material benefit, to get something. So that kind of following, that's not devotional service. Very good. Go ahead. Jana Sangha, association with worldly minded people. Who are these Jana Sanghas? Who are these worldly minded people that we should avoid? Could you categorize, could you give me some categories of these Jana Sanghas? Mataji, Leela Madhuri. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Mm. Holy minded people like Karmis Maharaj, like the people who don't know anything about Krishna. So when we uh, have a talk with them, there is a chance for us also be deviated from Krishna conscious, unless or until we are strong enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Only karmis? Anybody else? Um, Chagai Nithai. When, yes, ma even while, Go even ahead. while preaching, Maharaj, when we are preaching, though they are, uh, they are in your point in Krishna conscious. So when we. Of course, we should not avoid, but um, we should be very strong when we are preaching. That's, uh, that's what I understood. Okay. Yes, good. You should be strong. Yeah, you have to have faith. You shouldn't be diverted by <laughs> by the materialistic people. People, materialistic yes. people may try to change your mind and say, oh, you take this, oh, you waste your life. Don't you care about material things? Don't you think about your family? Don't you think about ma money? Don't you think about, you know, they, they'll try to divert our thinking. So we have to be, we have to have 
from faith and we have to be able to reply and if we're going for preaching we have to be able to respond to these kind of people. But generally we don't want to make friends with these kind of people who are not interested in Krishna consciousness. We may give them mercy but we don't want to make friends, we don't want to have intimate dealings with them. So karmis and then jnanis and yogis. Although they are spiritual, they may be on the spiritual path, but they're not interested in Krishna consciousness. They have their own ideas, they have their own goals. So we don't make friends much with them. We, we, you know, we, just, we can respect them in the mind, but we don't make intimate friendship with them. We don't spend much time with them. Because we know they're not interested in Krishna consciousness. They have their own path. Okay? Anybody else like to speak about Jana Sangha? Uh, just one moment. If you don't mind, let's go to Somya Mataji, who hasn't spoken for a while yet. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So I think we should avoid association with mainly Mayavadis because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said one who hears Mayavadi philosophy is certainly doomed. Mm, yes, definitely. Mayavadi philosophy. <laughs> you have to be very careful. When you preach in India, a lot of Mayavadi philosophy is there. Or just being in India. Pra Prabhupada said in Hindu society, he said, whenever you scratch the surface, if you go a little deeper into it, you'll see Mayavadi philosophy. People have this Mayavadi thinking. Ultimately, it's all one. Ultimately, we're all God, like that. They've got so many misconceptions. So one has to be very careful in presenting Krishna consciousness. So, Prabhupada also said, becoming a devotee is like married life. Just like when you get married, then you get new friends. You know, before you're married, you're single and you have your old friends, you, they're all single, you're single too, so your friends are like that. But when you get married, then it's different because you've got your husband or you've got your wife, so you're going to have different friends. It's not the same. So the same way becoming a devotee is like that. Then we have devotee friends, we make friends with the devotees who share our interests, who share our beliefs. But we can give mercy to the innocent people, but avoid those people who are not interested. If they have no interest, well, yeah, okay, we just leave them. All right, and then last quality, low yam, ardent longing or greed, being greedy for mundane achievements. Anybody have that problem? Have you seen this problem any, with anyone? Hmm. Any responses there? Hare Krishna, am I muted again? No, no, you're not Maharaj. Um, maybe um, we can go to Krishna Vijay Prabhu? Yes, Hare Krishna. So, Lolyam, like Maya, the Karmis are interested, they're too greedy to, you know, endeavor to earn more. S similarly, the Yogis uh, also, they want to merge in the Brahman. And uh, the other side is uh, like Narutam Das Thakur says, the Lolyam one should be greedy to associate with a few devotees or devotees. Okay, so you you want to transform that greed in in the service of Krishna? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sometimes mundane achievements, you know, something like somebody, you know, they're very eager to get some honor. Sometimes we want to get some big degree. You want to make great sacrifices. 
mundane achievements, somebody want, you know, they want very much to go to another country, maybe they want to go to America or to Australia, they're very greedy for these things and make great efforts. And they can sacrifice their Krishna consciousness for this. So, don't get carried away with the material world. Control the mind and senses. Be satisfied with what comes by the grace of Krishna. That's better. All right, I'll go ahead. A little quote here from the purport of text number two. I told you already that Achahara is going against that plain living and high thinking. But really the human life is really meant for this. People don't want plain living and high thinking. This is a problem. They're thinking they cannot be happy with plain living and high thinking. But we find the happiest people are not the wealthiest people. The wealthiest people, the most miserable people, the most, the most unhappy, the most morose, because they have everything, they're not happy. But at the same time, simple living high, we have to work for the maintenance of the body and also the soul. So we have to know how one can perform such work in a manner that's favorable for the execution of Krishna Consciousness. So Rupa Goswami is describing what is favorable and what is not. He's warning us, first of all, about the things which are not favorable. If we see that we're guilty of Ajahara, we should do something about it. Hmm? Oh. Before we go on to Ajahara, let's see text number three coming up here, because we, we take these two texts together, text two and text three. Text three is the six favorable activities, all right? So, someone can chant for me? Who would like to chant? Who's good in chanting? Every song. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So first item, Utsahan, enthusiasm. Very important to be enthusiastic. How does Srila Prabhupada describe enthusiasm? From the text? Uh, okay, then let's go to Muli Govinda Prabhu. Yes, Hare Krishna, Danda Pranamda. What is the question? Sorry, I didn't hear I want to know about how Prabhupada describes enthusiasm. How come Prabhupada describes? Enthusiasm. Ah, enthusiasm. Uh, it is like uh, we should leave all our efforts to do service to Prabhupada not Even in the material world, we have to be enthusiastic about being very interested uh, to have success in the thing we are doing. So we have to be enthusiastic in a very devotional service on that. Where did the Mataji come from, Krishna Keshav? I don't know. Mataji, somebody was actually speaking then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We must be careful. 
that we don't speak over each other, if, you, if we don't mind, um, because it does create some confusion. So please just bear that in mind going forwards, everyone. Thank you. So, Prabhu, would you like to continue? Bodhi Govinda Prabhu, if you'd like to continue with what you were saying. Sorry, Prabhu. That's okay. <laughs> so, that enthusiasm to know about Lord Krishna, enthusiasm to speak about Lord Krishna, enthusiasm to share about the pastimes of Lord Krishna with others. Yeah, could you give us a general definition of enthusiasm? general definition is like uh, to be very curious to know anything which is new. Okay. So, so even uh, in our ISKCON process also with the neophyte devotees, they should be very eager to know about this process, rules, regulations and what is devotion, what is association, what are the books meant for, how to read it. Okay. Thank you Prabhu. Srila, I think Srila Prabhupada describes it as endeavouring with intelligence in Krishna consciousness. Endeavouring with intelligence in Krishna consciousness. So that, that's how he thought of enthusiasm. And that was one of the main qualities which Prabhupada saw among the devotees, that the, we didn't know any culture, we didn't know anything about Krishna consciousness, but whatever Prabhupada told us to do, we'd do it with great enthusiasm. So it's a very important quality in every endeavour, enthusiasm. Okay, then, then the next two, Nishchayat and Daryat, confidence and patience. Prabhupada puts the two together in describing them and he gives an example. You know, there's still a lot of echoes there. So, would anybody like to respond to that? Um, Sharma Kunda Prabhu, yes. Thank you. Uh, Prabhupada explained that uh, Confidence means we believe that uh, Krishna will always protect us. Thank you. Yeah, what's the term which is given there in the purport that Krishna will protect us? How is it described? There's a Bengali quote. And somebody's got their mic on, it should be turned off. There's so much echo. Um, in the text, they said, uh, Avasya Rakshibe Krishna. Yes, right. Yes. That Krishna can give protection. And Prabhupada speaks, he gives an analogy about patience and confidence in relation to Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada gives a mundane analogy. Somebody seen that in the purport? What's the analogy? Chadai Nitai Prabhu would like to come in there. Maharaj, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, I think Ma uh, Prabhupada is, he refers to a young girl who just gets married and she wants to have children right away, but it takes time. Right. And she has to have confidence where? Yes. She has to have Confidence. confidence that the process will work, that she will get pregnant and the baby will be will come and it will uh, it'll all come in due course of time. What does she need to do? She needs to surrender surrender to her husband, right? Yes, surrender to her husband. Yes. So, so how does this compare to Krishna consciousness? Uh, yes, we have to surrender to our spiritual master, follow the rules and uh, of the guru and the practices, and then in time, as we become purified and we become advanced, Christian consciousness will take root, and then the seed of bhakti will grow. Okay, yes, very good. So these three 
confidence, patience, and enthusiasm, Srila Prabhupada said, in every endeavor, we need these kind of qualities. But particularly when we're speaking about advancing in Krishna consciousness, very important for us that we must have this in enthusiasm and at the same time patience. It means we're not going to become Krishna conscious immediately, not overnight. It's going to take a little while, and we, but we should be confident. We should have firm faith in this, that the spiritual master's instructions that this process is working, that it's very powerful, that kind of confidence is there. Okay? And then, tat tat karma pravartanat, meaning, someone like to describe this quality to us? Yes? How would Let's go to um, Acharya, no, sorry, I beg your pardon. Apurva Nila Cheshwari, Mataji. Do you want to answer that question? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Mataji, yes. For endeavoring with confidence. Yes. Mm. Your hand was raised, so I came to you. Okay, all right, so let's then go to Acharya Nanda Prabhu. Yes, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Relating to, I think according to regulatory principles, here um, Prabhupada uh, mentioned about nine process of bhakti. And process of bhakti such as yeah, Shravanam, Kishanam, and Mara. Prabhu, there's a horrible echo behind you, some background noise. We can't hear what you're saying. I'm sorry, there's a construction or some books are going on around. Okay, okay. all right. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I can skip this one, just let the other. Okay, then let's go to Lila Maduri Lalita Mataji. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare um, Krishna. The uh, Karma Pravartana is talking about uh, the rules and regulations if we avoid, uh, it will be destroying our uh, devotional service. So for example, the four regulative principles, Prabhupada speaks about this in this verse, uh, the four regulative principles which uh, we follow in ISKCON. Uh, if we don't uh, stick to these four regulative principles, definitely there will be a chance of falling down from Krishna consciousness. Uh, that is my understanding, Maharaj. Yes. And then you have to go on. Not only that. Tat Tat Karma Pravartana is describing two aspects. There, you mentioned about the yam, the prohibitions. No meat, fish and eggs, no intoxication, no illicit sex, no gambling, right? But you have to mention what about the niyam? What things do we have to do? Do you um, understand? You to, yeah? We have, have to follow the rules and regulations, Maharaj, so that uh, we can stay continuously in uh, Sattva Guna which will help us to get progress in Krishna consciousness. So t tell us, what are these rules and regulations that we have to follow? The four related principles, Maharaj, that no meat eating. No, we already had that. I want to know which ones we have to follow. That's what we don't, we don't, we don't do meat. Okay. Okay. What do we have to do? Yeah, you got it? Having satsang. Yes. What else do you have to do? And try to engage uh, continuously in uh, Krishna's service. Right. Yes. You have to read the books about Krishna. You have to worship Krishna. You have to chant the name of Krishna. Right? Yes. 
You have to remember, this is what, this is the positive aspect, right? The four principles, that's the negative, that's what we, we have to, we have to, of course, we have to follow them. These are the, those, that's called the, the, the yam, the prohibitions, the things we don't do. But the things we have to do, we have to engage in bhakti yoga. And, and that's also regulative principles. Regulative principles of hearing and chanting, waking up in, early in the morning, not sleeping late every morning, you know, waking up and chanting the holy name, doing Mongol arti, these things, right? Yes. Okay. So that is tat tat karma pravartana, two aspects to note. And then sangatyag. Give up association. We spoke about that a bit already. You notice it's mentioned both sides. One was Jnana Sangha, now it's Sangha Tyag. Giving up the association of non devotees. So, non devotees, karmis, jnanis, yogis, impersonalists, all these people. Then Satovrite, following in the footsteps of the previous Acharyas. Satovrite, following in the footsteps, means practicing our devotional service. As they chanted, we also chant. As they studied and read the books and preached, we also try to follow their example. <clears throat> Is it clear? Any questions about these six favorable and six unfavorable? So, Maharaj, it's coming up to um, 10, 1023, so we've got about five to seven minutes left. Yeah, so let's take some questions. Okay. I saw, there, was, there was two questions from yesterday, or from the last class. You sent me on the... <laughs> Yes, Prabhu, your question? If Mara, this is, can you explain a little bit more? The Tattat tat, tat Karma Prabhartana, this one, can you little elaborate Mara? Well, I told you, right, the, first of all you have to follow the four, very strictly, the four regulated principles, things we give up, and then we have to engage in hearing and chanting. We have to worship Krishna, we have to follow the activities which are favorable for devotional service. Like offering our food, studying Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, chanting our rounds, worshipping Tosi, these different activities. So, Maharaj, there's a question here from Harsha Mahavadji, yes. um, who is asking how to avoid the association of karmis when they are our family or in-laws, members of our families, etc., and, and we're all staying together, because they have a lot of material expectations from us, and, you know, try to avoid their irritation with us because we do not... Um, stands up to their demands. How do we deal with this situation? Yes, very difficult, right? Yeah. Many devotees in this situation, very difficult. But generally, you want to be cautious about uh, what you say to them and how you deal with them. We understand that they're not devotees, and they don't have faith in Krishna consciousness. But somehow, you know, because you're a family, you live together, and they love you, and you love them, it's all right, you, you, you associate with each other. But you, maybe you, you just have to be careful to do your practice, to do your worship in your own room, or away from them. You know, that you go to the temple and you associate there. And they understand you have your own diet, you have your own foodstuffs, it's all like that. You know, you want to 
certainly cultivate tolerance in dealing with them and at the same time show mercy to them. You want to impress upon them that you are a better person by practicing Krishna consciousness. They should see that, gen that you, you have a genuine improvement in your character and in your nature since you became a devotee. That you've become more considerate and more patient and you don't get angry so easily and you're generally, you, you know, you, you, you've become a, a much nicer person than you were before. They should actually see like that, that since you became a devotee, that you, you're happier, you're not so miserable and depressed as you used to be. So these are some points which I would encourage you to think about trying to show that mood to your family members. Can I give an example of, of a situation? Um, I come from quite a diverse Indian background family where we have lots of people in different walks of, you know, their spiritual, spirituality or not. And sometimes we have to go to a family wedding. Everybody knows that I am now a devotee and have been for the last five or six years. And I always accept the invitation to go so I don't upset the family and they don't feel I'm being or high and mighty and intolerant of their ways. But I do say to them that I will bring my own prashadam. And then that way I accommodate my needs, but I also accommodate their needs that they want me to be, you know, there because I'm still part of that family, whether I, you know, um, have any issues with it or not. Um, and it works because they understand my situation and I understand that, you know, it's important for them not to feel I'm being, you know, out of order in dealing with them. And so um, it works. Yeah, yeah. very nice. Yeah. yeah. And then we've got one more question here, Maharaj, um, from Murli Govinda Prabhu, who's asking, there is a saying, service to humanity is service to God. As we see, our organization is really wishing the welfare of mankind does a lot of activities. But I have come across people criticizing this attitude of ours. The attitude that we serve God and not man. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, people are generally materialistic and atheistic and they think, as I said, they, they don't want simple living and high thinking. But they want something like this. They think God is in the poor man. <laughs> so they have such a poor education about spiritual knowledge. How to deal with these? That's why our movement does try to accommodate uh, food things like programs like food distribution, giving, helping the poor, you know, when there's an earthquake, the devotees would go and they would distribute blankets and they would come and cook food. I myself, I was in Thailand in the year 2004 when there was a tsunami. And then we went there, I went there with, and we called some devotees to come from Malaysia and we were distributing food along with the other groups. So we do like to try to contribute according to our means, although that's not the ultimate issue. We're not a social movement. You know, people who feed the poor and take care of the needy, that's social welfare activity. All right, they give some temporary benefit. But we're thinking about giving eternal benefit to people, not temporary, not just feed people for one day, feed people for a day or two, and then they're hungry after that. There's a story about the one man, he saw the people drinking dirty water in the street. And so he brought some water, very nice clean water to give the people to drink. But then after they drank it, then the water was finished, then they cannot drink the dirty water anymore. 
So they were worse off than before because the man had brought pure water to them, but he couldn't keep providing pure water. So in the same way you feed people, how many people can you feed? They can feed very few people. How many people are they able to help the needy people? Only very few. But by Krishna consciousness, we can give benefit to everyone. Krishna consciousness is the ultimate auspicious message. We give the example, you water the root, the whole tree is nourished. But their process is to just put the water on one or two leaves or one, a few branches. They cannot help the tree. But if you, f if you feed the root, you water the root, then everyone benefits. Everyone is part and parcel of Krishna. So by satisfying Lord Krishna, everyone will be taken care of and provided for. That's a fact. And so we do invite people, you know, you can, be, you can also come to temple, we will give prasadam, we provide prasadam for everyone. It's not that we turn people away. We do try to help as much as we can, but our business is to give Krishna consciousness the ultimate welfare benefit, for an eternal benefit for the soul, not some temporary relief. Is it clear? Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Maharaj, it's 10.30 now. Okay. So, we'll have to stop then. Yes. There were two questions which we received and we didn't get round to them. Maybe I could just finish them before... Oh, no, please, please do. Yes. These were on the WhatsApp group. I think I sent them to you, didn't I, by WhatsApp? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, please do. Could you read, could you read the first one, Prabhu? Just one moment. Let me just um, find them, just for one second. Yes, so the first question was from Chidananda Nimai Prabhu, who was asking, how do we understand this transmission of knowledge and spiritual potency directly into the heart? We sing the Guru Puja prayers, Divya Gyan Hridaya Prakashito, where we pray to Gurudev to bestow Divya Gyan into our heart. In this connection, how do we understand this transmission as applicable to us fallen souls? Yes, as I said, my only wish is to have my consciousness purified by the words emanating from his lotus mouth. So the Divya Gyan comes through the words of the spiritual master. By the, the, by the powerful words of the spiritual master, it enters into our heart and purifies the heart. That is what happens. That's how we, the Divya Gyan takes place. By hearing, you have to hear from the spiritual master. Srila Prabhupada, if you've, t when you t if you've taken the ISKCON disciple course, I hope you have, and it mentions there that you have to hear from the spiritual master for one year. Hear from him repeatedly. And in this way then you can understand. Because by his powerful speaking and by our own inquiry, then you can impart that transcendental knowledge into the heart. Okay, then the other question? The other question was from Harsha Mataji, from Harsha Mataji who asked that she would really wish to understand when people humiliate us. How can that emotion of hurt be transferred and used in Krishna's service? We should think that their words, their harsh words are taking away our false ego. Because we are, we are hurt because of our false ego. It's our own ignorance which causes us to feel hurt, to feel bad. So it's actually purification. We should feel grateful to them for their harsh words. That thank you, by speaking so harshly to me, you're taking away 
my false ego and you're helping me to remember my actual spiritual position that I'm a tiny spirit soul but I'm thinking I'm my body because I think I'm the body therefore I am hurt but by your harsh words I'm able to understand properly that I'm not the body I'm a spirit soul so this is benefiting our Krishna consciousness our ego is becoming reduced from the body to the actual dimension of a soul understanding ourselves as a spirit soul yeah that's Krishna consciousness is it clear Mataji <laughs> So um, we have to finish there. Now I know there's a couple of more questions. Um, so please do send them on the WhatsApp group. We will read them out. We will, we will get to answering them. Um, but we do have to stop now because some people need to leave the class and it's... Right. Um, yeah. um, we do, we, you know, then everybody can hear these because some of these questions are really searching. So um, please do send them to, to, to me on WhatsApp. Plus four four seven five nine zero five nine two thousand or Krishna Keshava at myaporinstitute dot org. Um, I'll put those up on the WhatsApp group for you, and then we I'll make sure Maharaj gets them, um, and one or the other of us will certainly answer them for you. Okay, thank you so much, Maharaj, for your time this morning. Thank very you. much appreciate it. It was a wonderful class. Enjoyed that very much. It's nice to be able to listen thank to you. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhu Jai. 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 Thank you,